Go the ahead. photoelectric effect. Uh, so what happened with the photoelectric effect? We take this piece of metal here, any piece of metal, whatever you want. We, sh we shine a light on it. We shine light on it, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the electrons to, to rip off of it and, and, f and, and fly off it. And we can actually measure the kinetic energy of the electrons as they come off of it. So, okay, we see the electrons come off. We measure the kinetic energy. Cool. So then we say, okay, let's increase the brightness. Let's increase the intensity of the light. That means in increase energy level. Increase the energy level. What should happen? I would think that the electron should fly off with more energy. Just like if I were to punch this book, it's going to go flying off the table, right? But what happens? We shoot more energy at it, and there is no more kinetic energy. The electrons still have the exact same energy when they get released off of the, the metal. So we say, well, that's weird. How do you explain that? Well, so Feynman would probably say, well, if I were to light a cannon, me lighting the cannon is not equivalent to the force of the cannonball because this is a system that's being interacted with. So what, what is the answer then? How do we get the electrons to fly off with more kinetic energy? Yes. The answer is color. Color? Yes, color. The frequency is what determines how much kinetic energy comes off, not the intensity. The frequency. So what does that mean? So Einstein said, okay, the only way to reconcile this is I need to come up with this quantum of light. And I'm going to change the spoon size of this quantum of light. And that's how I'll rationalize how I can interact with uh, the metal in different ways based on the frequency. But there's a better explanation. The better explanation is just resonance. If we imagine, Dr. Yu was talking about the six degrees of freedom and how two of them are spin. Right? So really, Imagine we have spin, two spinning tops. Depending on how those spinning tops interact, you might have a very violent reaction. Like, what's that game people play where they do the spinning thing and they're battling? Beyblade? Or... Beyblade, right? right? So you might have a, a violent reaction, or if they're oriented a certain way, it might be a you know, very not very violent reaction. So that's the answer, is it's resonance, is that if everything is waves, then that metal, this piece of metal, is just standing waves in a resonance. And what that means is that if you hit it with another wave, depending on how those waves interact, you might have very little effect or you might have a very, very powerful effect. And then the last bit I was going to say on the photoelectric effect uh, is for photons in general. Like if we imagine that light is actually particles, does that really make sense? Like look at this giant room we're in and look at all the lights around us. If that was the case, it, I could be anywhere in this room and I could see the light which would mean that these light particles must be filling up this entire room all the time, bouncing around everywhere and hitting us and what have you. Now, if that makes sense to you, that's great. But that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me to think of like infinite amount of particles everywhere, bouncing around everywhere. Instead, what I think of it is, is we're just in a medium where we're just seeing the disturbance. Therefore, we're seeing a point disturbance here. It doesn't matter where you are in the room because the point disturbance is coming from this point. It's not just bouncing around and hitting my eyes. So is that, did I say that correctly, yeah, Dr. Yes, Yu, or yes, how would you, you explain you, it? You mentioned about two points. Uh, one is a photoelectrical effect, uh, which is so important because this is a foundational experiment to justify wave particle duality. So I'm gonna, so actually made a great job, but I want to give you my version of my explanation because this is so important. If you, if I can labor you, uh, the gentleman, if you can show the when the slide with a uh, photoelectrical effect, uh, that slides, I wanted to make sure. And the second point is so why he's bringing up, I will say the second point, actually, uh, actually try to build, how did he know the light cannot be particle? I'm going to demonstrate this one after photoelectrical effect. I, I hope I hope you guys, I, I try to make, make sure the audience uh, bring out, you know, you are talking about it on, on level higher mm -hmm. than general. I try to bring the general people uh, out here. Photoelectric effect, foundational experiment to justify what is the uh, called a uh, wave particle duality. Uh, yeah, the the the, the one down. Yes, that's right. the picture. Yes, are you able to make it bigger or or, uh -uh. or just, oh, I'm trying. Yes. That's oh, okay. Case. So, uh, why this well, is why this is so work. important. Classical physics made two mistakes to explain this one. The first mistake is in order to have a photoelectrical effect, so you have to knock electron out, called release, make an electron escape, eject from a particle. That's first mistake. I found out there's never ever losing electron in anywhere. Okay, so that's first mistake. The second mistake is assuming this is a uh, this phenomenon only happened to the energy level instead of a frequency. 
that, that was I shouldn't just try to emphasize. Different current means have a different frequency. So this is a, so that's why classical uh, explanation failed, and that's how uh, Albert Einstein win Nobel Prize by solving one of the failure, one of the failed assumption. Mm. He's still assuming electron has to be knocked out as forming electro for, uh, electricity effect. That's wrong. But anyway, but uh, what his improvement is, he said, hey, the electron. Does not, uh, not only you have to knock that out, but in order to make an electron to out, energy is not exactly the reason. You know, the reason is because they did a lot of experiment. They found, oh, different light. That's, I'm wondering about- Different light can, can release that one. So that's why Einstein said, hey, I'm going to put a, say, depends on frequency. So he solved that problem with Nobel Prize. Okay. Uh, the, the surface plasma, if you look at the way light interferes with plasma, yep. um, you'll have a cloud of plasma and at the center, you got plasma on. They're called surface plasma and they're, they're very sensitive to light. And the light will refract off of it exactly like this angle. They'll come in and it'll bounce. So you get photons bounce off of the plasma and then it looks like they transfer information to the plasma plasma because depending on how the light bounces off the plasma the plasma reacts differently that's exactly come to uh, what's the mistake they they both theory made that mistake they're assuming create electricity is not about the plasma or something actually it is if, if i were to explain that one they assume you have to uh what release electron so certain energy but what really happens is electricity have nothing to do with uh, Electron emotion. We right now we explain uh, electricity. They say flow of electrons, particle flow in the solid wire. Never made any sense to me or to anybody. Let me tell you. And what I found out, there's no electron, no particle uh, traveling in any solid wire when you have electricity. So this is just a false because we do not understand how what is electricity. Electricity is actually the particles on the surface. Say solar panel. When you have sunlight. You create with a resonance frequency. When you resonance create frequency, what happens? You resonance with atomic natural frequency induced called called called, uh, called resonance coupling. So then, what happens is all the particles on the surface of the solar system start vibrating, and that vibration of the particle on the substrate on the body. That's what electricity is. That's created electricity flows along the surface surface body. I hope, <laughs> Ashton, yeah. if you, you wanted to explain, enforce this concept, it's so important. Yeah, well, I would say that, you know, we're talking about the ether and that light is a wave here. And one of the things, too, that we can prove that this is potentially the case is, well, people say, well, what about the Michelson-Morley experiment? They'll say, oh, Michelson-Morley showed that we're not in this medium of energy. If, if Tim, if you could pull up my Twitter on the most recent retweet I just did right now, actually a guy named Martin Gruznik uh, went ahead and he redid the Michelson-Morley experiment, which I think is very interesting and will connect to all of what we were talking about here. So if we can share this video real quick, and we don't necessarily need the sound on, but you can kind of just show it is that he first takes a standard Michelson-Morley experiment and spins it around horizontally. So this shows that, okay, well, so, the Earth... So what, what is this ex experiment? Oh, the Michelson-Morley experiment is a, a laser interferometer. So this is actually kind of similar to double slit or to oh, entanglement where we split light down two different paths. So we split the light down two different paths, and we want to see, is there a change between one path or the other? If we see some kind of shift, that would mean we must be in some kind of medium because something's moving the light. Otherwise, if we're in an empty vacuum, there shouldn't be any shift of the light at all. So when we spin it around horizontally, we can see right there, there's no interference. There's no shift in the movement there. So you would say, okay, there must not be an ether because you're not seeing the light get manipulated at all. But look what happens when we turn it vertical. So we take the exact same experiment, turn it vertical, and now look what happens. Watch closely. Whoa, that's the interference pattern shifting for sure. So we can see the interference pattern shifting, but why? The only thing that's happening here is either those light beams are closer to the ground or they're further up in the sky. That's what's happening when it's vertical. And it turns out you can see them shift to the right and you can see them shift to the left. The inflection point where that changes is actually where the mirrors that split the two light beams are perfectly perpendicular to the ground. So what could this possibly be that could account for this? To me, there's only one answer. There is a vertical ether. Well, what, what is there that changes when we go higher or lower up from the Earth? Pressure. Gravity. 
gravity changes, right? The further up we are, the less gravity there is. The closer we are to the ground, to the center of the earth, the more gravity there is. So there's a guy uh, named Ishmael, I believe, out of, uh, I'm going to forget, that's somewhere in the Middle East. They said the ether exists, but it's a vertical ether that's pushing down on us. And this would now connect to, remember, zero-point energy. Gravity is a zero-point energy force. So now what we're saying here is that, yes, mass is displacing space-time, but space-time is zero-point energy. And that's why we see the interference pattern shift here is that we have a vertical ether. Wherever we get a gradient in our gravity, a gradient in the zero-point energy, you're seeing the ether happen. What do you think, Dr. Yu? Yes, I, I want to emphasize that this is a Marcuson, uh, Marcuson or Mikkelsen um, Maldis experiment. This is a, so important, okay? So one thing is they try to do, they're assuming uh, this is a rotational ether, they try to measure mechanical motion, mechanical ether. And if you, if you realize uh, what I try to say is this is a uh, magnetic fluid. It's a magnetic nature. So that's why they cannot exactly use measure mechanical motion. So you see the, the, the inference patterns are changing, the right switching, right? So you do detect something. They do have a e e mechanical motion there, but just so tiny, not enough to justify their uh, prediction. However, if you consider this is a magnetic fluids, the magnetic inference, that's part of mechanical motion, does not reflect at all. Then you will tell. It does have, a, uh, does have a, the ether we call the electromagnetic field, right? General uh, ether, because that's carry the light, carry uh, all electrical signals, you know, uh, receiving from the spacecraft. And also our thoughts, propagation, is all through this field. I got questions about this Mor Morley experiment, um, Michael Michelson Morley. So, okay, so they spun it around horizontally, nothing changed. We know that. Now they spin it 180 degrees up. So what what's happening? Why, why does it look like it's going to the left and to the right? It, is it because is it the angle away from the gravitational force? It's further away it's, from the ground. Yeah. It's almost like a um, time space Coriolis effect. When uh, there's really funny videos where they'll be will be in Ecuador or anywhere on the equator. And they'll walk like 30 feet and then there's a, a tub they fill with water and they'll pull the plug and the water will spin clockwise. Then they wheel the, the cart 30 feet south of the equator, fill it up, pull the plug and it spins counterclockwise. Well, so okay, so due to the rotation of the earth, they're getting the they're getting a, a so what, distortion in the in the what you end up seeing is it shifts left and right every time it reaches a certain plane. Yep. Wow. Yeah, depending on which plane. So either one oh, or two good. on the image, that will determine whether or not it's either shifting to the left or the right as it continues going forward from there. I, I kind of imagine it like we're we're in a the three dimensional space we exist is actually an infinite number of two dimensional planes stacked on top of each other. Yeah, that's a, that's exactly how you explain dimensions, actually. And that's you know, there's a this like young kid that's like got this video out there. I think he's older now, but that's how he explains it with stacking books on top of each other. So with that's with how we think about it, yeah. So with a two dimensional space, when you're moving within one plane and you're staying within one spatial plane, nothing changes. But when you start moving between an infinite number of planes, you'll start seeing the lights start moving as you're going through different. And that can explain the disturbance in the medium that we're seeing and how light can be a disturbance in the medium. And going back to the double slit experiment real quick, um, with the double slit experiment, uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out is that John Kramer, the same guy we were talking about EPR experiments before, he's got a theory called transactional, uh, the transactional interpretation. And this is important because they can do the double slit experiment. Double slit experiment, if you're not familiar, we have two slits. We shoot an electron at the slits. And oh, we say, have a picture if we can display that. Oh, do we have a picture on your yes. slide? And then you, yeah. you explain. Yeah, and you I will give you my Which one is it? Uh, oh, the double slit. Double slit experiment. That's yeah, so, so important. Yeah. I can, I, my, so we have this way. So we have this electron that we're shooting at these slits. And we would say, okay, if it's an electron, it's a particle, then I should get two slits on the back because uh, it's going through either the left slit or the right slit. But when we do the experiment, we get a wave pattern. We get an interference pattern, which would indicate that the electron is actually a wave going through both slits. Oh, it's different. So then we say, okay, go. well, let's look. Let's set up a measuring device that looks through at one of the slits to figure out where the electron is going through. And the weirdest thing happens. The moment we set up the measuring device, boom, now it becomes two slits, as if it just starts to act like a particle. Here's the craziest part about it. We can do this experiment with light from stars that are billions of light years away. 
So we can do that with these light because we call this phenomenon non-locality. It's almost like the universe is reacting to what we're doing. But the weirdest part is, okay, we would say, that's cool. It seems to be some kind of faster than light interaction that's happening there to allow that to occur. But why does it work for light that's billions of light years away? Because if that's the case, then somehow it's like, am I going back in time and changing the way the light was released from the star a billion years ago? And this is where John Kramer says, only my theory can account for this, is that we have an advanced time forward wave moving forward, and that's being met by a reverse time wave. And they couple, and there's an exchange of information that determines what should happen in our reality. And to me, that point goes back to what Tim's saying is that the answer has to be we live in a simulation. You can't be rendering things in and out of existence without us being in some form well, of simulation. Thanks for watching this clip from the Culture War podcast. We're live every Friday, 10 a.m. to noon. So subscribe and come hang out.